Experience the thrill of the race with Scalextric, proud sponsors of the Motorsport Podcast. Throughout the history of motor racing, the drivers have always been the stars, the heroes who make the headlines. But we all know that their performance depends on some brilliant engineers and designers. In these podcasts, supported by Scalextric, we aim to explore what it takes to handle the greatest racing drivers with some of the sport's most talented engineers. Our guest is Dick Bennett, whose West Surrey racing team has such a rich history in the sport. Dick engineered Senna, Hakkinen and Barrichello, among others, through Formula 3, winning five championships, starting with Jonathan Palmer in 1981. He moved successfully into touring cars and is still winning today in the British Touring Car Series. We welcome a truly versatile engineer, another one from New Zealand, by the way, with what appears to be an everlasting ability to win. Dick, welcome and thank you very much for giving us your time. Uh, no problem at all, Rob. No, good to be here. As I said, it's a birthday today, so what better way to be doing than talking motorsport? Yeah, well, happy, happy birthday. Thank you. You've had over 100 class and outright wins in the British Touring Car Championship, so I think we should start with that and then move backwards. And I wondered, um, first of all, what, what do you make of the new hybrid cars um, that were introduced last year? Because some of the teams, I think, are saying that they're just too expensive for not a big enough gain. Partially true. I think it's um, the BTCC was the first um, championship to go into hybrid. And I think that was a, a stall that Alan Gower wanted to set out. And Yes, it has been more expensive than we all were led to believe. Um, it does make a difference because when we have one BMW chase and another BMW, you've got the same aero, you've got the same, not quite the same setup on the cars, but when you push the deploy button for the hybrid, it just gives you that little bit extra. Yeah. We would like a bit more, but I think it's fairly limited on what it can do at the moment. Well, of course, um, in the case of BMW, uh, last time out, you won all three races. <laughs> Yes, yeah, we, we hadn't had the best year up till Alton Park. It, it all seemed to click there, so hopefully we can carry it on uh, when we get to Croft um, the end of July. A lot of 21st century motor racing, particularly in recent years, I, I think has become a little bit processional. What would you say to that, and would you have any solutions to make it a bit more unpredictable, a bit more exciting, say. We have different committees on the BTCC, a TWG, a commercial group, and it will be discussed that we were hoping when we carried ballast weight, 75 kilos if you won, that made quite a difference. Now we don't carry that because the hybrid kit itself, everything weighs about 60 kilos. So if you're leading races and winning, it's not boring. <laughs> But, yes, some of the races are a bit processional, but they have been in the past as well. But I do think it needs um, some tweaks to make it a bit more exciting. I'm a great believer in softer tyres because then the tyres go off um, and that makes it harder to drive. Um, the tyres are a very good tyre, the good year, but it's a bit too durable. There's hardly any degradation. And years ago, when there was degradation, that made the racing a lot better. For, from an engineering point of view, Dick, what direction would you like to take at the next round of the rule changes? Because you've got so much experience of racing in general. And now with these saloon cars, presumably somebody like you, I mean, you want to challenge, but you also want you don't want to be carrying around tons and tons of weight because it kind of goes against the grain, doesn't it? Yes, the, the current rules are you have to use a production shell, production doors, production bonnet, etc. And then, of course, the, the base weight before the hybrid came in was 1,300 kilos. Now the base weight, I have to say, for rear-wheel drive is 1,355 for some reason, the front wheel drives are still 30 kilos lighter, which is a, 
a personal gripe of mine. Uh, that was brought in years ago when the tyres degraded and the rear-wheel drive cars had an advantage off the star line. We don't really have that anymore now because there's certain restrictions on turbos and restrictions on up to 110 kilometres an hour. That aside, it's um, it's a good set of rules. It's Because I can go back to the super touring days when we started in touring cars, 96, and an engineer's dream because the regulations were so loose, but the budgets were just horrendous. Um we thought we had a good budget from Honda at five and a half million. When the Super Touring all finished year 2000, got to speak to a few of the other team owners, and I know Ford spent just on 10 million to win it. The year before with the Nissans, they spent nine to nine and a half million. And here's us thinking we had a good budget. And the car was different every race weekend. So as an engineer's dream to keep on developing a car, but at the end of the day, the budgets were just out of control um, for a, a national formula. I mean, obviously, those kind of costs these days are, are not sustainable. If you could uh, introduce a rule in the next round, would there be one place that you would definitely like to see changed at the moment there's no big prize fund at all there's nothing there which i think that something is missing from a, you know apart from the british grand prix the btcc is the best championship in the uk live television but we've got lots of trophies in the workshop but there's no prize money so <laughs> i think that would help a lot if there was some travel money prize money so that is something that's on the discussion list for this winter it's a great championship you know there's good crowds um, but it does need a tweak here or there to to make it even better that's a typically straightforward answer dick <laughs> how do you think it's going to play out as as turkington and jake hill try to catch sutton and ingram how do you how do you i mean this this part is exciting <laughs> How do you yeah, think? Uh, can you ask me another question? <laughs> no. no. <laughs> um, yeah. Great to have some, uh, you know, we've now, uh, at my age, I was hoping, you know, three cars was enough. Now we're geared up to run four. Wasn't on the agenda, but it's, um, yeah, it's it's a good challenge. But, yeah, to have Jake and Colin, um, it's great to have two pretty top flight drivers in the team. We've also got Adam and New in this year when Stephen but it appears that virtually everywhere we go, Colin and Jake with slightly different setups can be within a tenth of each other. So that gives us some headaches from the pit wall during a race. But they all know the team orders. Um, we race. We don't have team instructions at the moment. That is something that we don't bring in until later in the year. If, you know, if one driver can't win the championship, then we asked him to try and help the other one. But as of last year, they could both win it right till the final round. Yeah, great having two, two top-line, very quick drivers, but, yeah, it does, just gives us a bit more headache from the management side. Yeah, but this is a headache you've had for what? Uh, yeah, it's, it's a good headache to have. I'd sooner be fighting at the front than fighting at the back. How are these two guys as far as understanding the importance of feedback and to, to you as the, not only the boss, but, but also as such an experienced engineer? Because these little differences, like in all racing, but especially it seems in, in BTCC, you know, tiny differences make a big difference. Yes, it's quite surprising. A lot of people don't realise what goes on behind the scene. When we do um, workshop tours, people don't realise the extent the cars get rebuilt. Some of our sponsors and their various associates think that it's like a road car. You race in the weekend, you go and do another job during the week, and then you bring the car out of the garage for the next race. But our cars, I think all the top teams do it. They get stripped, engine out, gearbox out. EV motor out to check that, the hybrid motor, the Cosworth parts. Subframes come off the car, suspension comes off, gearbox gets inspected, the diff gets inspected, the dampers get dynoed between every race meeting. Steve, our chief technician who's been with us since 1989, he is very good with dampers and gearboxes. So we are still developing the dampers. We keep playing 
We've got three sets of spare dampers, so each engineer from each car has a option to try a different damper. There's, there's a good range of adjustment within the damper. Every car on the grid carries the same control Pinsky damper, but you are allowed to change the pistons and shims and play around because dampers are a big part of touring cars. So yeah. also the RML suspension, all the cars, front-wheel drive, rear-wheel drive, all have the same subframes front and rear obviously we carry a diff in the rear subframe we have debriefs and the guys go through all the data we have um, some very good data engineers and we we study the setup from one car to another and see if we can learn but then one of the areas that you can't i've always thought there's one best setup but when you have like colin right foot brakes jake left foot brakes so immediately okay. there you have a different scenario when you arrive at a corner. Colin tried left foot braking many years ago, but he's had gone back to right foot braking. So we have two drivers left foot braking and two drivers right foot braking. So that determines your initial setup when you arrive at a corner. So it's but they have all the laptops, they have all the data. I don't use a laptop. I'm from my old school engineering, listen to the driver and make changes. But there's so much data now on the system that they can see how much the car rolls, how much it dives, how much it squats. So that gives gives them information to make changes to suit that driver. But each driver has an overlay. We don't have any secrets. They're all open book. I'm very strong on that, but there's, it's a teamwork together. So if Jake's quickest, Colin, Adam, and Stephen get to see that. If the other one's quicker, if um, Adam's quicker, one track, the other drivers and engineers look at that data. So a good way of keeping things equal or giving everyone the opportunity. But then we have the other added issues like not issues but the regulations the next race we go to at croft we have to run the three different compounds so soft medium hard so that throws another spanner in to when you're going to run your tires and that you have to qualify on a medium tire but then it's up to the engineer and driver to decide which race they will run the last time we at uh, alton park we the regulations were two sets of soft tyres, one set of hard tyres. The forecast on Saturday was rain on Sunday at four o'clock, five o'clock. So everyone, our guys, all ran race one and two on soft, thinking it would rain for race three. It didn't rain. So we raced on the hard tyre and it was very good result. We were all pleasantly surprised how good the BMW was on the hard tyre. There's a lot more involved in this than meets the eye from the TV coverage and the general, the spectacle of the thing. I mean, it's fascinating. The amount of detail involved now in, in this, isn't it? Oh, it's down to <clears throat> ambient temperature, down to track temperature, because we're turbocharged as well. Obviously, under the bonnet gets very, very hot. Um, we are looking at trying to reduce that temperature down. There's some expensive wraps you can buy to cool things down, but we always do back-to-back -back testing because sometimes you might read something, the advert speaks very highly of it, but in some cases it doesn't work. So we've actually got a test on July 4 at Donington on the Grand Prix track, so we'll be testing some new components then um, to try and help us for the second half of the season because as you said earlier there's two other drivers ahead of us and we need to try and rein them in a bit that's why i asked you how you thought it was going to play out but uh, yeah. I, it's unpredictable i guess yeah. well, if you ask me pre alton park i thought we're, we're not looking good here but after alton park now we're back in the game again you are. How good is Turkington? I ask you that because um, Jake Hills has, has, you know, young guy, he's surprised quite a lot of people and he, he does historic racing. So it's a, a double question, really. How, how good is Turkington? And are you, how do you feel about Jake doing historic racing? Jake drives everything, single seaters to old Formula One cars, to sports cars, to old touring cars, um, which I think is great how we can adapt from one to the other very quickly. So interesting next weekend at Brands, the Super Touring Festival, but we're having a, two of the BMWs on display. But Colin is racing an old BMW and Jake is actually racing Anthony Reed's, I think, mm -hmm. or Gallo's Nissan Super Touring. So I've told Jake, I said, don't come complaining about our cars now because you're in the 
absolute top of the range super touring car that won the championship in 99. Whereas Colin is, he still tests other cars from the BMW Car Club, done a few races. Jake is more spectacular to watch than Colin, mm-hmm. but Colin is Mr. Quiet, gets on with the job and delivers. Um, whereas Jake is exciting, you know, he's on the ragged edge, um, gets on with the job and, you know, She'll be right. He's he's on it, you know. So they're quite different characters. But at the end of the day, as I said earlier, they can both qualify within a tenth of a second of each other, wherever whichever circuit they go at. Yeah, for for Jake to be driving all these various cars, I think it's good to adapt. Colin does drive different cars, but he's he's also got his two sons now, which are getting into motorsport. So he's spending some time helping them to to find their feet. You've been lucky over the years, over the decades, shall we say, to have, you've had some very spirited drivers. We'll, we'll come to them in a bit later on, but um, they make the, I mean, they make the job more exciting, don't they? More interesting if you've got, you know, that, that amount of talent and. Yes. They're, um, yeah. Back through the single seater days, um, even before WSR, when I worked for Fred Opet. Uh, Ron Dennis, um, we ran various drivers yeah. all over the world, New Zealand, America, Europe. Yeah, I, I get asked quite regularly, am I going to write a book one day? But I probably can't tell all the stories that I know. But no, we have had some really interesting drivers, even through WSR from the early days with Jonathan, trainee doctor. When he first drove the route at Goodwood, the Stephen Johansson's, the Project 4 one, um, is very impressive. So that's how we finished up setting up WSR or WC the first year because they didn't have anyone with that experience of an aero car. So I helped them out and they went the wrong way the first test on themselves. So I said to Mike Cox, who owns West Surrey Engineering, you've you've wasted your money unless you have someone that understands this car. So I was already committed to go home to New Zealand to help my mate Dave Oxton with a a RELT RT4, Formula Atlantic, Formula Pacific car. I didn't want to let him down because I I said I'd help him if he bought one, and I didn't think he would buy one, but he he rang me from Canada and he said, I've just bought a four-race old RT4, you've got to help me. So... So I was committed to go home to NZ Christmas 1980, and we went on and won the championship there. Plus building a Cosworth BDA engine. I used to be an engine builder, so I was a busy man for five weeks. Um, I was only home for seven, so it wasn't much of a a holiday. Yeah, but that's what New Zealanders do, isn't it? I've been home for four years now, so I'm going home next January, but... January, February, but I've also tied it in or make sure fit in two race meetings, one at Taupo and one at Highlands in central Otago, my home area. It's a good way then to catch up with the old mates who are still involved in it and friends who come along and you have a beer or a wine and reminisce over the old times. Good tracks too. I like like those tracks. Yes. (laughs) Before we go back a bit to Formula 3, can I ask you a little bit about your childhood? Because um, these podcasts are supported by Scalextric, and um, favourite toy in all the world was Scalextric. Um, I had a wonderful... Oh, I, I've got some here behind me. Um, You've got some there? Ah, yes, OK. Wow, yeah. yes. <laughs> were, you keen on, were you keen on that in, with your, your early days? We used to go slot car racing. In my earlier days, I was more involved in modifying engines, getting all my mates in Dunedin to get their road cars going fast. And we did um, hill climbs and grass track racing. So I'm more involved in that. Then I had an opportunity to move to Auckland for a, um, performance development. It's a great company. And then I got asked to come to, or if I wanted to come to Europe with David Oxen, the Formula Ford champion. Uh, the plan was originally a, a two-year working holiday, and I'm still here. So, so we came over in July '72. We'd only been here a week, and we went bought a car, went to the British Grand Prix at Brands, found our way, and finished up on top of one of the coffee hut things, watching the Grand Prix. I thought this is my, in my element. And even when I was at school in New Zealand, French lessons. I thought, what do I want to learn French for? I'm 12,000 miles away from France. And the little bit I did learn when I first went to France, no one understood me anyway. But the main thing was when I was in French lessons, I'd be tucked away in the corner reading motorsport magazines, reading all about Cosworth, Alan Mann racing, 
all these companies which you know you read in magazines and then you know suddenly i'm here and um reality it's a bit lucky you never had a french driver then really isn't it uh we did have an f3 uh a young very very young lad jeremy dufour okay uh, 90 oh got me thinking now 93 i think it was he was quick but just too young um he jumped the ladder too quick to you know to learn it properly but yeah no the scalistic models now are, are fantastic um little and they're so detailed i cannot believe how they get them so accurate every little sticker um but also we had um the last race i think two years ago at brands bmw uk had the scalistic circuit there um had the track inside their display unit unbeknown to me one of them was very quick and i didn't realize you could tweak the motors in the scale history oh. and this one particular car was like always kept beating you know and i thought hang on something's when you know i think with most of those toys you can but saying that they're going to a different thing when we ran senna and guzelman and f3 they both had these jet skis very quick but neither of them content to have a standard jet ski they would spend a lot of money having them modified to beat all the other jet skis of the same model they always wanted to you know show their hand that they're better or faster but yeah back to the scale district yeah great great models this podcast is supported by scale Extric. listeners can claim 10 percent of all Scalextric products by visiting www.scalextric.com and using the code RACE10. That's R A C E in capital letters, followed by figure 10, RACE10 at checkout. This offer is valid until the 30th of September this year and cannot be used in conjunction with any other offer. A full list of terms and conditions is available on the Scalextric website. Uh, Senna is really a dominant figure in West Surrey Racing's heritage, isn't he? I mean, what made him stand out for you back then in, in 83? I first met him in 82, mid-82, um, through Dennis Russian from Russian Green Racing. And um, Dennis said, this guy is very good. Keep an eye on him. Be known to me, EJ, Eddie Jordan was chasing him. <laughs> and I'm not a commercial man. My background's engineering, so I could never win a battle with EJ on the commercial front. There's another little story there as well I'll tell one day. I'm sure there is. <laughs> Ayrton asked for a test, so we did a test, half-day test at Snetterton, and he... He was in the Kiki Mansilla car, the 82 car, and he was very quick first time out around Snetterton. Obviously, he knew the track well because he was a works Van Diemen yeah. driver, Formula Ford 1600 and Ford 2000. But he impressed me, and we then decided to do that non-championship race at Thruxton, 82. And he was in the Mansilla car. He was just dominated, pole position first, fastest lap. And I thought, well, wow, this guy... He is very good. So shook hands on a deal. He jumped on a plane back to Brazil. And I didn't hear from him or see him until he arrived back in late February. And we bought a brand new car. We always had a new car each year, a newer model, slightly different. And he was actually quite upset that he said, I like that other car you had last year. I said, well, we have to sell that. Um, to live through the winter. And interesting enough, that car was bought by Helmut Marco for Gerhard Berger. Gerhard arrived at our little workshop to pick it up and I wouldn't let him take it away because he arrived with an open trailer in the middle of winter. He was quite upset. I said, hang on, we've just rebuilt this car like brand new. You're not taking it on an open trailer in the middle of winter back to Austria. So he, he lost a day while we wrapped it all up and covered it to make sure when Helmut, Dr. Marco, saw it, it looked as it was presented brand new. And then, of course, 83, the new car wasn't a lot different than the 82, but he, he didn't take him long to like it because he won the first nine races. So I knew the bubble would burst one day, and sure enough, around 10 it did. So What was it that made him different from other drivers that you'd known before, though? I mean, in retrospect, we know now just how uh, incredibly talented he was. Was there something about him that, that was different? He was an all-round package. I get asked a lot about who's the best driver, but you can only relate it to the year they're in. But And one example I use is Senna and Huckenham. When we ran Mika, that guy's raw talent was every, every bit as good as Ayrton's, if not better. 
but Mika couldn't tell you what the car's doing. He would just use his hands to do a debrief. And Ayrton could sit and tell you every corner, every part of the corner, what the chassis is doing, what the engine's doing, incredible memory retention. You know, he could even two or three days after a race or test, he'd ring me up and say, Dickie, I've just remembered this and that. The car did that halfway through the race. What do you think it is? Whereas Mika would just drive the car, get out, great, you know. But uh, as far as the talent goes, they very equal. But as I said, Ayrton's feedback, and another one of Ayrton's friend, Mauricio Guzelman, he was very, very good with his feedback too. Um, whether it's something the Brazilians learn from go-karting, I don't know. I actually tried to catch Mauricio out once. We were testing at Alton Park, and we were playing with the rear suspension geometry. And we made one change, and he actually said, that feels better, it does this, does that. And he went a tenth, tenth and a half quicker on the stopwatch. I couldn't believe how small change he could feel it, and it was quicker. So I told the guys, the mechanics, just rattle your spanners around the back, and we'll send him out. So I sent him out, and he's right, where you go, go and do another four laps. He come back in, he took his helmet off, and he said, I've got to be honest, he said, I can't feel any difference with that. What did you do? And I, I couldn't keep a straight face. I said, we didn't do anything, Rizzi. I just wanted to check you out. How? And I said, you're very impressive because we didn't change a thing. His Brazilian English was very good, I can I can tell you. So, <laughs> um, but he went on to win the championship on his first year with a... And also, it was um, a big change in regulations. We went from a, a full ground effects car to a flat floor yeah. car. And he went on to win Macau Grand Prix, the same as Ayrton. But he said to me, I don't know what to do now. He said, I budgeted two years with you. I didn't think I'd win it first year. I said, I wish you'd told me that. I would have slowed the car down. <laughs> Just as an aside, it's interesting about Mika because he, he told me recently, I asked him about uh, driving for you, racing for you. And he said the, one of the problems for him was that he could barely speak English. And he felt, and even when he first went to McLaren, and I think that was maybe part of his problem with uh, communication. In yes, I um, uh, I felt embarrassed after, but the first test he did down at Brands, I gave him a, a map of the track and a little T I M C E X turn in mid corner exit, Paddock Bend, Druids, Graham Hill, Leaways, um, Surtees, and I said just fill in the map. I went back up to the garage to see the guys preparing the car. And I came back into the front of the um, race trailer half an hour later, and you still got a blank piece of paper there, not one word on it. I said, come on, mate. And he actually said, oh, I, I can't write English. And, you know, silly me, I fully expected him. So I, I filled it in for him. But his, like, you arrive at Paddock Bend, it was like that. A bit of turn in, OK, then a bit of oversteer. So we did a whole lap with the hands debrief, and it worked, you know. And another thing, it was... He was quickest in the dry, and he said, yeah, yeah, he just shrugged his shoulders. But the thing he was most happy about, he was quickest in a wet test, because then 89 night, David Braben was regarded as the rainmaster. And Mika went quicker, and I said, why are you so happy? So everyone says, Braben, David Braben's the fastest in the wet. He said, now I'm the fastest in the wet, because the car he had the first year of F3 was not so good on... Um, the team was new into F3, so... It was difficult for them to fully understand. So Mika was very, very happy man. And again, he, what was, what do we call it? Um, a request from Philip Morris, because we obviously in the UK, we weren't allowed to carry Marlborough on the car for race weekends. We just had the black vertical stripes. So the UK boss, um, Graham Bogle, they were under pressure from head office of Switzerland. Why are you giving this money to the UK, to a UK team to do a, the British F3, and he said, because we think the championship's very good and the team are good. So then we got asked to go and do one race in Italy, one race in Germany, one race in France. So I thought, oh, this is a tough one. So we went to Imola up against 42, I think, Dallara's, mainly all with Alpha engines. And we arrived on the Thursday, did a few laps around in the higher car. What, what sort of downforce do we run? Um, I've never been to Imola. Um, so we decided like Silverstone Grand Prix down fourth. So we set that up. We went the first test, didn't do bad. Then come qualifying, you're only allowed 10 Michelin tyres. So he went out first set, P1. 
like, well, this is you know up against all these locals. And then right at the end, Dominic Chatterella, I think it was, yeah. he picked us to get pole, and Mika wanted to put the second. So I said, no, no, keep them. We'll scrub them in, keep them ready for Sunday's race. But, yeah, but you know, I said, you're still starting front row. Don't worry about being on pole. They've used their second set of tyres. We can use the half set on Sunday morning warm-up, which we did and went quickest because others only had two new tyres left for the race. So we went, I think, half a second quicker in the morning warm-up. So that rattled the locals. And then, of course, the race, we had a set of just scrub tyres ready to go. And he went, from memory, they red flagged it about three times on lap one. And I jokingly said to Mika, don't come round first, come round second, because I don't think they like you leading, winning. But he, we went on to win that one quite comfortably. Then we went to uh, Hockenheim. And, of course, Michael Schumacher was racing. And the first qualifying was Friday evening, and we had a, a misfire. The ratios I was given by in Germany F3 team were miles out. For no. It was on the rev limiter so early. On the old Hockenheim track, the long one, we used the same suspension setup as in, and it didn't work around Hockenheim. So I think from memory, we were 21st quickest and thought, you know, a German journalist come along, ha, huh, you British champions, you're supposed to be good. I said, yeah, we've got to. We've got a few little problems. So uh, rang back to the UK to Neil Brown, who was doing our Moog and Honda engines. He, we changed everything on the engine, plugs, ignition leads, um, all the wiring, you name it, the ECU. We actually had the spare car there, the Minoru Tanaka, the Leighton House car. So we even took the tail light off that in case there was a short somewhere in the system. We replaced everything. Changed the suspension around, changed the ratio, went out on old tyres Saturday morning, and he come past, and there's no car to pitch radio in those days. It was the old plug-in Peltor. He come past, thumbs up, so we brought him in with an arrow on the pit board, right, bung the new set of tyres on. Meanwhile, Michael's sitting there on pole comfortably, arms folded, Mika goes out, three laps, bang, pole by half a second. Michael went out then to try and better, but he had already used his tyres. So so we won that one by about, I think we crossed the line when Michael was coming in to the last corner of the stadium onto the pit straight. It was about a five-second win. So that's two out of two. And then we were supposed to go, I think it was to Dijon in France. And... They made it so hard for us. They said, you can't bring your transporter in. Your driver hasn't got a French license. But hang on, we've just been to Imola. We've just been to Germany with the same license. I rang up Philip Morris. I said, they're making life hard for us. He said, don't bother. He said, I'll pay you because you've already proven that you've got a good driver and good team running in the British F3. So... Philip Morris still paid us for the third round. We didn't do it. And then to um, get one back at them, the circuit, um, promoters, whoever, he pulled their signage from around the circuit. <laughs> so, yeah, happy days. You've really got to do a book one day, haven't you? Th those Formula 3 days were so exciting and there was so much talent. And, of course, you know, many, 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 many people still say that Hakkinen was at least the equal of Schumacher. If not, if not faster. Well, the the Macau Grand Prix was a killer for me. He should have won that, but he was. I didn't know at the time he was in dialogue with Lotus for an F1 drive, and he got pole. He won race one comfortably, starting the last lap, fifteen lap heat aggregate in those days. Um, I said to him, "Win by biggest margin you can, but be it do it safely." <clears throat> so starting lap 15 in front of us, he was four seconds ahead of Michael. He crossed the line one and a half seconds, 1.7. I said, why'd you slow down? He said, I have a big big lead. I said, yes, but you've now got heat two. You need to win. I said, if Michael slipstreams past you now, as long as you stay within one second, you've won the Macau. Oh, yeah, yeah, I understand. I said, I went through it again. You must, if he does pass you, which he did on about lap four, you must stick within one second and then you've won. If you drop 
1.7 seconds behind, you've lost it. Oh, yeah, yeah. So he stayed within one second. I thought, good boy. Again, we couldn't talk to him in the car. And then going past us, starting the last lap, he was right on Michael's gearbox. I thought, why are you so close, you know? And then they went out of sight, and there's a big cheer from the crowd. And I thought, oh, he's got back past him. So I ran upstairs. We had no TV in the old pits. Mm-hmm. Ran upstairs, and here's our Ralph in the wall, one written off Ralph. And I was so annoyed. I just could not believe he had chucked away the Macau. And what made it worse, instead of celebrating Sunday night, we had to build up a new chassis because we were racing in Fuji the following weekend. So instead of a nice relaxing night at Macau, we were we worked till about 1.30 in the morning. So, yeah, he wasn't in my good books. No, I imagine not. Um... I think he just tried to win both heats to show Lotus, you know, but he would have won the Macau Grand Prix. You respect it. But, yeah, that's Mika. <laughs> Racing drivers, eh? Who needs yeah. them? <laughs> um, let's talk about the car because uh, you were very, very loyal to Ralt. And I wanted to ask you, I mean, you had different engines in them, Toyota, uh, uh, Mugen Honda, but... We had an Alpha for two years. <laughs> probably best not to, spoken about. Yeah, Bert Gasho, when we couldn't get a... We finished um, 87, we went back into F3. Bertrand's first race at Thruxton, he finished second to Johnny Herbert, and Johnny had a... EJ had a electronic space engine. We had a mechanically injected engine development Judd engine, little engine, very light. But Bert said, no, our engine's no good. And so we flew to space... Space, good old EJ had done an exclusive deal. No one else in British F3 can have a, a Space F3 engine. So then we flew to Italy, went to Nova Motor, and the Alpha F3 engine on their dyno, I saw it running. Um, I used to run a dyno, so I thought, I know how this works. And, you know, it had, oh, 67, had about 14 horsepower more than our Judd Volkswagen. I thought, okay, we'll have this. We'll win the championship easily. A, it was much heavier than the Volkswagen, so the chassis handling was out. And B, it had no torque at all. It was all just top-end power. So we persevered, worked with Nova Motor through the year. We changed the engine around, got it going better and better, finished second in the championship. So then we ran Eddie Irvine the following year with the Alpha, and it's still... You know, it was a shame for Eddie because it it still didn't deliver until we went to Macau and put it on Avgas there and he got it on pole, Eddie. So it was just the fuel we ran in England didn't work with that engine. So then we switched to the Mugen Honda, which was then Alan McNish and Derek Higgins year one. So that was the beginning of, you know, we won a provisional winner with Alan. That was another tricky one. Um, won it in 90 with Mika, won it in 91 with Rubens, runner-up in 94 with Vince Rademacher. So, yeah, good engine, yeah. How, how closely did you work with Rout and uh, Ron Torinac? If you believe other people down the pit lane, we were a works team, but we <laughs> it's only because our little workshop was only 15 minutes from the Rout factory, we were down there every day. Me being a Kiwi, Ron being an Aussie, sometimes it was... Some good debates went on, <laughs> but I respected him. He respected me. So we had a, a good relationship to the point where if he wanted something tested, he would ask us to test it for him. And sometimes I go back with the negative, sometimes positive. Um, but also Ron had a bit of a habit of having a built-in design problem. And we were normally... Uh, one of the first or the first team to spot it and rectify it. And that was one of the problems early 85, the flat bottom car, Maurizio knew into F3. He kept saying there's something wrong with the front end and we couldn't find it. We couldn't find it. We tested and tested, but it was ringing a bell because we'd changed springs. Like in those days, we only used to run, I think it's 350 pounds spring, 300. And we had 25 pound increments. And we changed springs 25 pound, no better, no worse. Change again, softer, harder, no difference. Something's wrong. So after a Silverstone race, we went back to the workshop and we stayed in the workshop till one or two in the morning till we found the problem. So then I went to the Ralt factory the following lunchtime and I knew the storm in there, James. 
I said, James, can we have a pair of front rockers, preferably unmachined, because West Surrey Engineering had a very good machine shop. He said, what do you want those for? I said, oh, I'm just having a play. So he come back with a pair of rockers, perfectly machined for the bearing for the rocker, but not machined where the push rod and the damper went. So we went back, plotted it out, re-machined, put new holes in it, went testing straight away, fixed the problem. So Maurizio was happy, I was happy. Then one of the other teams must have spotted because the rocker just used to stick out from the nose cone. And I got a phone call from Ron. What are you doing? What have you done to your front end? I said, I'm just having a play, Ron. And he got in his car and drove across to the workshop. Why have you done that? I said, just because we think it's better. Of course, we started winning races then. And then I said, OK, Ron, this is why we've done it. And he didn't believe me. He went back to his drawing office, got the draftsman to plot it out. And he rang me, he said, oh, you're right. He said, the draftsman got the rocker ratio wrong. It was pushing the push rod. It wasn't doing that. It was pushing. So the car would just go stagnant. He said, well, I've got to give it to all the other teams so we can beat rain. I said, no, no, no. I said, we found it. We need an exclusive for four or five race meetings. So a big debate. And eventually, I think we had exclusive for two meetings. And then he issued it out to all the other teams. Good fun times. I don't remember that many of us knew much about that at the time. No. That, that's, a, that's a good story. I like that. It's interesting. And, of course, I mean, Touronite built sort of very practical, usable, raceable, well-engineered cars, didn't he? Is, yeah. Is, is, that fair? Um, is that fair? Ron was, um, to build a cheap car, he used a lot of angle alloy. Oh. So he would buy it from a shop. And he would machine it, and then you'd have so many bolts. It's incredible the amount. Instead of having one cast bracket, you'd have a – I nicknamed it bracketry in motion, the car, because it was a bracket on a bracket on a bracket, whereas you could have just done with one. But Ron, to keep the cost down, he had this, you know, bracket. And, of course, when you built the car at the factory, you weren't allowed to deburr the sharp edges, and we had what we called rout rash your fingers would be cut to pieces because every bit of machined angle was so sharp. We used to radius it all, but he's, no, no, you're not allowed to do that. It takes up too much time. You can do it back at the factory. But I said, then we've got to strip the car to do it. Yeah, but yeah, basically it was a, a very good heat. I think with the help of Patrick Head from Williams, um, the aero of that car, the, the, the side pods were, because um, we tested a pair for Ayrton, or sorry, for Ron, at the end of 83 for the final round, and Ron had a front geometry mod and a side pod mod, and I looked at the geometry, oh, something to do with the Ackerman steering plates. So Ron said, you can have first choice, and EJ gets the other one for Martin. So I chose the side pods and went testing at Snetterton, and also had the engine rebuilt at Nova Motor, and it was much better. We had the Nova Motor engine rebuilt in the UK to a standard spec, but we we thought Martin had a slightly better engine. So for the final round, we sent Ayrton back with the engine back to Nova Motor. He spent a week there, and um, the engine was better when we tested in the morning. Then I put the new side pods on just prior to lunch, because we were at one end of the pits, EJ was at the other end, <laughs> and Ayrton come in smiling, he said, these feel great. I said, but you haven't gone quick. He said, I'm not trying yet. So we went and had lunch. He went out in the afternoon, same old tyres, and he went quicker again. And we were like considerably quicker in F3 terms than Martin. So we thought, okay, are they not, are they not showing the hand? They haven't got good tyres on. So we put a better set of used tyres on, went even quicker again, and Ayrton said, the car's fantastic, the engine fantastic. We're ready to go to the final round at Thruxton, which, again, he dominated. EJ was not happy because we had the side pods and he had the steering, which I don't think made much difference. So that they were then the 84 pods, the last year of full ground effects. So we used them at Macau as well. Um, we had no spare, so if we had an accident, we had to put the standard pods back on, but luckily we had no no accidents. That was a tremendous, an absolutely tremendous season. 
the battle between Brundle and Senna, wasn't it? And Brundle says that at the last round at Thraxton, which none of us will ever forget, the officials had a word with him and Senna on the front row. Sid Offord, I think it was, who was the head man at Thraxton. That's right, go cool, yeah. He had uh, he had a few words, I think, with both Brundle and Senna before the race about not making contact with each yeah. other. I believe. Well, we went into that race because of the some of the problems um, that Ayrton didn't like finishing second to Martin. That we finished up. <clears throat> I chose number eleven to start the season because I'm confident he we'd be number one. So I just had to peel off one of the 11s to make it number one. I actually had to go and buy a number two for the final round at Thruxton because Martin got ahead of us and I, the pressure was on then. So, um, yeah, and also the battle with Martin being British and on British circuit and a Kiwi-run team with a Brazilian driver, we weren't, weren't flavour of the month. So it was, a, it was a tough year on that respect, but... You know, at the end of the day, the results counted. It was a very exciting year. Look, um, there's so much to talk to you about, but can we go just back to touring cars? So I'm talking in the mid in the mid '90s now, really. Tell me, what was it like to go from what we've been talking about, Formula Three, to closed cars, completely, utterly different type of racing? Um, did you miss? Did you miss anything about the single seater racing? Probably what uh, one of the main reasons to switch to touring cars. A, I got an invite from Paul Radisich, fellow Kiwi, to go and have a look at a super touring race at Brands, and I was impressed with it all. But behind that was when we had the routes. It was always a challenge to make it the best route on the grid. Once we had a Reynard for one season, half a season because that was the period where everyone was switching to Delara's. Yeah, yeah. So we bought a Delara, and we could not develop that car to be quicker. So hats off to Delara, fantastic production customer car. So it was a bit boring running a Delara because we couldn't tweak it much. Mm. It was very good out the shop, factory in Italy. So I thought, oh, this is getting, you know, we're, we're always finishing first, second, or third in the championship unless we didn't have a top-line driver. So I thought, Time for a new challenge, have a go at touring cars. So we did a deal. We we won the contract with Ford, but we didn't design or build. There was no time. And I have to be honest, halfway through year one in 96, I could have chucked it all in and gone back to F3 because Reynards was supposed to build a new car. But in fairness to Adrian and Rick Gorn, that, Ford made a very late call, so there was no time to design and build a car. So we had to get a couple of Mondeos from Germany, Schubel Motorsport, and they were front wheel, uh, all wheel drive. So they had to be converted to front wheel drive. And their design engineer, a British guy, um, John McLaughlin, he's passed away now. He was responsible, but of course, every time we ran the car, something broke because it wasn't used to having all the power and torque through the front axle. So midway through the year, we'd be standing in the workshop two o'clock in the morning, something else is cracked in the chassis, something else is broken, something else is cracked. And I just thought this isn't what I signed up to. But then 97, Reynards built their Mondeo, but again, they were pretty new into touring cars, built fantastic Indy cars, fantastic Formula 3000 cars. Um, but their their super touring car was very high tech carbon fiber engine mounts, which <clears throat> when you have the primary pipes, the V6 about five mil away from it, the the carbon engine mount would melt. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we're into redesigning. So eventually we got a a chance to design our own car, ninety eight, and we were about a third. We had the first shell almost built. And I took on a lot of good top-line engineers, designers, Greg Wheeler, Will Phillips, some good guys. And we were getting well down the road, but then somewhere down the line within Ford, the misunderstanding that someone else within Ford gave the project to another team. So they were running the Honda Accords. So we finished up getting the Honda Accords for 99. 
and they got the Fords. So <laughs> we did a swap. So then we ran the Super Touring Honda Accords 99, 2000. So, yeah. um, but 98 was the interesting one when we ran Nigel for three meetings. I never used to be a Nigel fan, but after running them, I am a Nigel Mansell fan. When I saw him getting chains in the back of the race truck, the scars down his back were unbelievable. I said, what are you doing still driving? He said, I loved racing. I love driving. So, yeah, he was. He had a couple of accidents. But the one at Donington, when he had the accident race one, he didn't think the car was repairable for race two. But I said, no, Al, we've got some good guys, good fabricators. Roy Sauke, we main fabricator. We got the car, Steve, our chief mechanic, car rebuilt. We said, ready to go, Nigel. He said, oh, I didn't think you'd get it fixed. I said, yeah. So he had to start last, 19th, in the pouring rain. And I'll never forget that race. He came through to lead it. Um, unbelievable, you know, up against John Clellan, Derek Warwick, all these famous names. And Nigel got so excited, then he overdrove it. And he, he I think we finished fourth or fifth. But that still goes down as one of the best ever super touring races or touring car races. So, yes, I'm, I'm a Nigel fan now. Yeah, that's very interesting. I think a lot of people have had that experience in the sense that once they once they see the way he approaches his desire to win, his, well, I mean, his talent, his speed. Just tell me briefly, I mean, by the time he came to drive with you in, in the Ford, I mean, you know, he was he he'd won the world championship, he'd won the IndyCar championship. What was it? Tell me about his approach to. Well, first, actually, let's make it simple. Why why did he do that? Um, it was a request from Ford Motor Company for some PR. So I believe Nigel got paid handsomely for doing three race meetings, and we did about five test days. Um, the biggest thing is adapting to front wheel drive in those days. Quite difficult um, coming from single seaters with a lot of aero. Um, but he persevered, and yeah, you know, on occasions he he really showed some good promise. Had a few few rubs with other drivers, so he upset a few. <laughs> but end of the day, it was it was a, a marketing exercise for Ford. And they reckon the money they spent was well worth it from the TV coverage from that Donington wet race alone. See, what, what would he like to work with as an engineer, Dick? He was uh, a tricky one. <laughs> he wasn't the easiest, but because he was learning, and of course the car still wasn't the best car on the grid by a long shot, it was his interpretation of how a front-wheel drive car works when our engineers had already been front-wheel drive guys, so it was delicate at times to try and persuade him to not go down that road, go down this road. At the end of the day, he, he accepted our you know, uh, recommendations, and it's difficult because the tyres in those days didn't last long. We had tyre warmers, everything, so um, adapting to the different tyres was not easy. Because, of course, same with the current cars. Now, you put on a set of soft tyres, even with no tyre warmers, they're mega. The car feels great. But when you go back to a medium or harder tyre, the car doesn't feel as good. But that's 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 a fact. So, yeah, yeah no, Nigel was um, interesting as feedback to how he interpreted it, to how we interpreted it, because we had the data on the car. We had to show him sometimes the data overlays. You should have been a diplomat. <laughs> Um, right. Look, uh, we're nearly nearly out of time, but um, I wanted to ask you about Tom Christensen. This was towards the end of your super touring uh, yes. days. Again, I mean, you know, we in retrospect, we know what this man has achieved. It's extraordinary. I wondered if you could tell me a bit about working with Tom, because he's not only very quick, but he's an intelligent guy and had worked his way up to, to where he was. Very nice guy. He one of the one of the best we've worked with. Um, such a polite guy. Unfortunately, with the Honda deal, we didn't design the car. We were just paid to develop it and race it. So we when Tom came in end of 99 for 2000, we went all around the UK, all the circuits in the 99 car, which we developed into be a, a good car. So Tom was happy, but then we had to run the new 2000 car because Honda had paid the design company 
to build these new cars. So long story short, we were given a request sheet, what would we like to see on the 2000 car from Niner? So the first thing was more caster on the front. Uh, it only, the 99 car only had about eight degrees caster, which isn't much for front wheel drive. We run more than that now on a rear wheel drive car. So our request was about 13, 14 degrees caster. The new 2000 car arrived and my chief mechanic, Steve, said, come and have a look. So I went downstairs and I looked under the bonnet. He said, yeah. I said, yeah, what am I looking at? He said, have a look again. There's no power steering on the car. You must have power steering when you have a lot of caster. So I rang the design team. I said, what's going on? He said, oh, the team in Italy who run the Honda said it's unreliable. So we're not running it. I said, but you've got to have it because the caster. No, no, it came with five degrees caster. So <laughs> Tom went out in it. He said, this is undrivable, far too much understeer. So I said, can we run the 99 car? Honda said, no, you must run the 2000 car. We've bought an expensive car. I said, okay, can we fit power steering? No, because the car is built and designed to what the Italian team wanted. I said, okay. but So I then rang... Ron Taranak, who had very good connections with Honda Japan. Ron rang Japan. He said, right, there's some money. You can go and develop the car with power steering. I rang the Honda German R&D guy, and I said, right, no, no, you mustn't fit it. I, okay. We went ahead. He said, it's a six-month project. We did in two weeks. We worked stupid hours. Machine shop was going at 2 o'clock in the morning, the lathe, the mills, and we had power steering fitted, and we went out straight away with about 12 degrees caster, and Tom said, now we're on the right track. So by the time we got to the end of 2000, we won the last two ever Super Touring races with Tom. And he got out of the car. He gave me his crash helmet as a present. He said, if we'd started the year with this car, we would have won the championship. And I said, sorry, mate, but I said, you know what went on behind the scenes? <laughs> Um, he said, yes, unfortunately, such a nice guy. His first ever win at Alton Park was on the long Alton track. And we'd warned him about being careful of the curbs because very low car in those days, the right height rule. And he clobbered the curb across the chicane and he split the sump. And we could see smoke coming out the back of the car with 10 laps to go. So we radioed into him. He said, yes, I can smell it. I said, right, just be keep an eye on the dashboard for the oil pressure warning. So he finished the race, won it, and there was no oil left in the sump. Neil Brown guy said, one more lap, that would have blown. But Tom got his first win, and, um, yeah, very impressive. Very, very quick driver. Again, you know, jumping from a sports car, Le Mans, you know, into a touring car wasn't easy, so... And I think from memory then he was testing a Williams, I think, Formula One car. Yes, he did have a Williams test, yeah. Yeah, so, um, no, fantastic guy. Um, so I suppose, you know, looking back, I mean, he, he was, he was you could say, he was the perfect driver to have had at, for those last two, uh, super touring races because of his ability to sort of read the car and feel the car yeah. and... Yeah, he was quite disappointed we weren't allowed to race the 99 car because we had that working really well. But, uh, you know, the politics behind it all was just something that we couldn't, you know, control in those days. Whereas nowadays with the current regulations, we design the car to the current rigs and we control what we do. OK, look, um, it's your birthday today. And I wondered what keeps you going? I came to the UK because of motorsport, um, my two-year working holiday. I still love it. Um, the politics sometimes can be hard going. Um, we have a very good crew of guys, so I am standing back a bit now, um, but I still get involved on the engineering decisions, the big decisions. The race engineers do their own things within a certain parameter. I still watch motor racing on TV. Um, I'll be going to the British Grand Prix. Um, I'll probably go and watch the Moto GP, the bikes at Silverstone, especially Moto Three. They're fantastic. You get fifteen of these young kids coming down into Brooklyn side by side. The technology. Um, I still like reading about aero engine development. Yeah, so technology side of it. 
whether I completely retire, uh, I promised my wife I would, but it's something that is in your blood and it's hard to get out. Yeah, as I said earlier, sometimes the, the politics are frustrating. I'm a pretty straightforward Kiwi, that, you know, spades a spade. It's the buzz of winning like at Alton Park. Then suddenly you think, right, you know, we can have a crack at winning this championship. We're already working on plans for next year. We're waiting on a final go ahead. Um, but yeah, it's something that, you know, I watch you know, the young Louis Foster's doing Indy Lights this year or NXT. You know, I like watching his races. The TRS series in New Zealand for young kids, the Toyota series, Lando Norris did it. Um, a lot of young kids do that while it's winter in the UK. Um, that's a fantastic. And, and I'll go and watch one of the race meetings there and watch these young kids, how they give their feedback. I know the circuit owner, Tony Quinn, and um, his lady who runs it all, Josie. Um, it's great being involved with those sort of people. And it's like a busman's holiday, but it's still... I come back here. As I said, we've got a good bunch of guys and girls here. Um, we're very thorough how we approach it. If I couldn't do it properly, we pro I probably wouldn't do it because it's hard to win at the best of times in the BTCC. So unless you put a big effort in, have the right amount of people, the right type of people, it's it's hard. So it keeps me going. Is it the politics that's kept you out of Formula One or did you never have any any intentions of doing Formula One, for example? Um, <laughs> yeah, I, um, I've always liked smaller teams. When I worked for Project 4, when I worked for Fred Opert, with Fred Opert, there was five of us guys running three Formula 2 cars. Now we have 20 at a race meeting now to run four cars. We have 28 people. Ron Dennis Day is a small team. We ran Formula 3, Formula 2, and we also ran that BMW M1 Pro car. Mm -hmm. Um, I sort of team managed and engineered Nicky Lauder in 79. But that was, Ron ran a small team. So Ron was in the process of buying McLarens to go Formula One. And Ron actually offered me a job to be the test team manager. And I, I don't think Ron knew then that I shared a flat with two guys from McLarens, one guy from Brabham's. <laughs> So I get all their stories of, you know, they said, don't work on the testing. You'll have all the hard work to do, which I'm not afraid of hard work. But if a race driver crashes a car, they pinch the test car, and then you have to build a new test car. So, so I said to Ron, thank you for your kind offer, but I'll say no. And he, he pursued me for about six months to do it. And jokingly, for my 70th birthday, he did a little video clip unbeknown to me by my lady she had organised this video, and Ron said, if I'd stuck with him, I'd be a wealthy man. So maybe true, but to me, money's not everything in life. You've got to enjoy what you're doing. Um, I may have enjoyed F1, but in those days, I used to say, I don't want to be number 42 of 300. In these days, I'd have to say, I don't want to be number 700 out of 1,400. I follow F1, the technology in it's unbelievable. Um, I think, you know, the Red Bull, you know, Adrian Newey, wherever he goes, he's he understands zero. He's fantastic um, with his capabilities. But it's good to see others, you know, Aston Martin catching up. And Alonso is incredible for his age. You know, he's a breath of fresh air. But he's the, he's the new fan, Joe, isn't he? Yes, yeah. But I still follow people like Young Lando because I watched him doing the Formula 4 as a support race for the BTCC. So I watched him grow up um, since he was about 12 years old. So there is some good young talent out there, um, which you know, I, I still follow and keep an eye on. But as I said, my background's engineering. I wasn't commercial. But if I was more commercially minded, I might have had a, a commission from all these guys that went from us to Formula 1. <laughs> um, I think it's 15 of our drivers went to Formula One. Yeah. Yeah. So, no, still happy what I'm doing. I keep saying it's the, the end, but I just one more because I should have, you've just reminded me that I should have asked you um, how influential and how, how useful, if you like, was your time at Project Four? Um, I enjoyed it there. It was a small team. I started off uh, Formula 2 
because I had been working for Fred Opert for two years. I ran Keke Rosberg in F2 and I also ran Keke in New Zealand for Fred Opert. We won the championship both years, 77, 78. Another very quick man, wild on occasions. <laughs> um, so I left Fred and then I joined uh, Rom at Project 4. So first year was um, Eddie Cheever, Formula 2, but then Ron uh, asked me to help uh, with another couple of Kiwis, Kev Weston. Uh, we built all the BMW customer cars up in Woking. The kits arrived from Munich and we built them. And then I think we assembled 24 odd. And then Ron R.D. said, one more, Dick. I said, no, oh, we've had enough. Well, we're, we're working 16, 17-hour days. And he said, right, this is for a special drive. I said, oh, yeah, yeah. So we agreed to build it. And then um, he said, I'll tell you who it is when we get to the racetrack. So we built this car up again. Again, a little problem. I said, Ron, what racetrack? He said, the F3. I said, it's... The BMW M1 Coupe was quite a heavy car compared to an F3 car, so I, he said, use F3 transport. I said, well, the tail. He said, no, don't worry about it. It'll work. So loading up this M1 Coupe on the tail lift of the F3 truck at 3.30 in the morning, we had to be at Silverstone at 9, the tail lift failed. So the guy said, what are we going to do? I said, we have to we have to be at Silverstone for 9. So we, we found the problem. It had broken the old tube, the copper tube, the old aerocrypt, um, the old hydraulic line. So we aerocrypt it. But I said, first of all, I'm going to go and ring Ron. So 3.40 a.m. I went in the office, rang Ron. He answered the phone. Uh, what's up? I said, Ron, that discussion on the tail lift. He said, yeah. I said, it's just failed, broken. He said, you've got to be at Silverstone at nine. He put the phone down. <laughs> so... We aero-equipped it, bled it all, loaded the car, home for a shower, back straight to Silverstone and um, unloaded the car. And sure enough, then a helicopter comes in, lands. I thought, oh, this is serious stuff. Out hops Ron and out hops a gentleman with him, Nicky Lauder. So Ron said, you think it's worth it now? I said, oh, maybe. So, <laughs> so we actually went on to win the championship with Nicky. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, and then the following year, 1980, we ran Hans Stuck, chalk and cheese to Nicky. But interestingly, we won the Monaco support race, F1, with Nicky in 79 and Hans in 1980. Chalk and cheese drivers, but then something, sponsorship didn't come through or whatever. So Ron asked me to help out with um, the Formula One car, the first ever carbon chassis, John Barnard. Um, I did that for four or six weeks, but didn't really enjoy it. Um, so Ron asked me to take over the F3 team then. They were struggling with the March car. They'd won it in 79 with um, Chico Serra, I think. Chico Serra. Yep. But yeah. in, in 80, we had Stefan Johansson and they yeah. were struggling. So jokingly, I said to RD, I said, well, there's some young kid in a route, Rob Wilson, some Kiwi guy, he, he seems to go quick on occasions. So we jumped in Ron's Porsche, went to the route factory. The two Rons had a meeting. I was in the workshop looking at this bracketry in motion. And Ron came out and said, you've got what you wanted. I said, no, no, no. I said, I didn't say I wanted one. <laughs> I just suggested you look at it. So we actually got the car and we went to Goodwood week after week, and we couldn't get it going quicker than the march. It was embarrassing. So eventually one day I just said, right, we've had enough of the Ron Taranac setup. We put our own setup on it, and instantly I knew by the old stopwatch, there's no iPhones then with TSL timing on it. You had the old stopwatch, and I knew straight away it was quicker. So we then raced it and won the last four races, and Stefan went from third to first in the championship. So, yeah, great. That was the beginning because that's the car then that Jonathan used and it's still sitting here in our showroom now. Jonathan owns it and it's absolutely immaculate, double championship winning car. So I guess the answer to the question is Project 4 was quite... Uh... Yeah, no, interesting. Um, I did have no issues with Ron. Some people didn't really think he was that great a guy, but he's 
come from a similar background to myself, but he was obviously a lot more commercially minded than me to go on and take over McLaren's and turn that around to be a, such a successful business. But no, I enjoyed my time there. You know, Formula 2, Formula 3, Pro Car, no, it was great. Thank you very much. Thank you for giving us so much of your time on your birthday. No problem at all. Experience the thrill of the race with Scale Electric, proud sponsors of the Motorsport Podcast.